Hey, 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 you guys. Let me fix this. Uh oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I am going to, first of all, happy Tuesday. Hope everyone is doing well. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, What is that, Frey Frey? Hey, Julie. First of all, let me say, Julie, thank you so much. Julie is my dance agent. Um, Julie and I have um, built a relationship, um, just, you know, a personal relationship outside of just being an artist and to, with her as um, uh, as as my agent. And I just want to shout Julie out um, because... Julie goes above and beyond, right? So she cares about me, and I'm just one of thousands and thousands of clients that Julie has. So um, I really appreciate you, Julie, for supporting me and everything that I do. I appreciate you taking the time to really um, make adjustments and and support your, um, you know, your 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 talent and your, your, your friends and your family and whoever of, of black people that, that, you know, and supporting them in this movement. And I see that you are, um, making like a, a, a big, big effort and not that you weren't doing it before because you have always been supportive of me. I can't speak for anyone else, but like, ask me, how am I doing? How are the kids? Anytime that I need to take off from not going on auditions because I'm having another baby out the blue or whatever, you have just been so, so supportive. So thank you, Julie. Um, so a few of you guys are in already. I'm going to go ahead and bring Keith in. You guys, I'm really excited to talk to Keith. He is an amazing, amazing person. We have lots to chat about today um, with a little bit of time. Um, I'm sipping on my tea. This is oregano tea. I posted a video about the tea that I'm drinking, and this is by Buddha Teas. Um, and I made a batch. I'm drinking cold tea today because it's really hot in LA, so I did not want to drink hot tea. Um, so let me see if Keith requested... To come in you guys are going to really enjoy this conversation with Keith um let me take a sip Keith did you request to come in yet I see that you're in here there we go there we go it's coming in coming in hey. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking some time out. You are a busy, 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 busy man. So thank you for taking this time out. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. I know. So you guys, Keith is in New York. Do you mind me sharing? Keith is in New York. Um, Keith, um, I met Keith a few years ago um, to talk to him about a project that I was working on. And Keith has just been supportive in so many ways ever since. Are you drinking tea? This is water. Oh, it's water. Okay. Mm -hmm. Water will do. Water will do. Um, so Keith, I'll let you I'll let you introduce yourself to everyone, Keith. Hey, what's up everyone? Um, my name is Keith White. I'm happy to I'm happy to be here. I'm an attorney in New York, but I also um I also um do a couple of other things, run a food pantry, run a social justice initiative through my church, as well as do some mentoring work and some activist work through um, or with um, my organization, the Brooklyn Combine. We're going to get into um, some chat about the Brooklyn Compound, Compound before we end this conversation. But before, I want you to share, Keith, share with us your black joy that you just shared, because you got some black joy to share. Right. So, um, so I'm super happy. Uh, I'm super happy that my um, my oldest daughter just graduated high school, and then my congratulations. Daughter, right, and then our second oldest just graduated from middle school, so she's going to high school. So yeah, so so to, it's you know, in in spite of a, a bunch of stuff, today's been a today's been a really good day. Yeah, you guys were celebrating all day yesterday. How is that? You are in a house full of women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how is that for you? How how is how is raising young girls in this climate and um, how are you maneuvering and teaching them about um, 
you know, navigating through this climate with everything with, you know, that's going on. I think that, um, I mean, I, I used to think that I spent a lot of time like teaching them and guiding them and raising them. But I think that um, the process has been kind of like reverse. I, f I feel like I spent a lot of time learning about who I need to be in order to support them as they, as they, you know, as they kind of maneuver and navigate this world. And so I think it's been more about that than, 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 than me teaching them and raising them. It's been more about us, you know, developing, the, developing together and developing and learning our humanity and learning how, how we should exist in this place. Mm -hmm. And what, just, just really, really briefly, what's been their perspective on everything about what's going on now coming from them as youth what what's their perspective of, of things it's it's crazy i think that their reality is very is very different than mine you know i think that for most of my life the the world and all of its traumas was a very normal thing and then um and then 9 11 happened and 9 11 happened when i was an adult right and 9 11 happened and then I think the world seemed different. We seemed a lot more vulnerable. Um, our privileges as, a, as Americans um, kind of came into the forefront for me. I think that um, for, for, for my kids, I think it's different for them. They came into a world that was post 9-11. They came into a world where America was being and needed to be challenged about its foreign, foreign policy. Um, where they came into a world where their blackness was very much on display and they knew it and so their existence has been completely different so the pandemic when the pandemic happened um for me it was like wow like we've seen the disproportionate effect that it's had on the black community and it was just kind of like wow another wake-up call while my kids who are on the front line of another conversation um coming up in the world they were like yeah like yeah like this you know this makes sense it, yeah. yeah 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 and and i'm assuming i mean brooklyn has become um such a diverse neighborhood now i mean i i grew up some of my life um, my family had family in brooklyn and too so brooklyn back in the day for me i'm all back in the day like i'm 80 but mm -hmm. um when mm -hmm. i was growing up it was for me it was like dc it was like predominantly a black neighborhood but that has changed now so your your daughters have, have integrated in, in friendships right that they're not just all black kids so how are they navigating that what is what is different for them with that are they seeing things through a different lens is it hard for them to kind of um i don't know you, you tell me because it's different for my son for sure yeah well it's not true I th my, my my kids have all black friends um all black friends they have all black friends they go to predominantly white institutions mm -hmm. um and i think that that's what i meant by like their blackness was on was on full display, like on their, display. Their, their, their blackness was like, um, you know, was a badge. Um, and I think that um, in these predominantly white institutions where many of the kids are privileged, um, you know, I think that there was the idea or the, the desire to be comfortable and find your space in those places. But then when they come home, we're challenging them. Um, and why they shouldn't be trying to find spaces in those places. Um, and so yeah, there's a conflict there about even being in these, in these types of places and in these mm -hmm. types of schools and trying to seek acceptance. So, I mean, I think that, you know, you know we have a strong kind of like ethic um, about our blackness and not in our house. So, um, and it's not that, hey, you know, you shouldn't have any white friends, but your white friends, uh, your white friends are gonna have to be a certain type of white person. And what I mean by that is whiteness in America has made people value sameness, homogeneity, like the idea that, you know, you fit into groups, you fit into, you fit into norms. And I think that um, for them to have white friends, those white friends have to be accomplices in destructing or destroying white supremacy. And so, you know, they haven't found that. Absolutely. 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 And so, um, and speaking of 
of, of COVID and how things are shifting. Um, talk to us a little bit about, I really want to get into the financial part of this because that's what I really, um, I feel like, I mean, I know myself, like to be educated more on how to um, build a better financial future for myself, for my family, and for my kids. Um, talk to us a little bit about what does invest and divest? What is that whole framework? What does that mean? And what are the key components of it? So, um, so to, I mean, obviously to invest is in something is to put your money into it with the, with the hopes that there'll be some type of return. To divest um, is to pull your money out of the system that doesn't serve you or that's contradictory to your values so um so in that so in that regard there's been um you know there's been uh a lot of investment into police there's been a lot of investment into um into structures that are completely anti-black or anti-poor anti-working class and so um, really, the, 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 the concept behind divest is, hey, stop, stop funding your oppressor. So if, if your oppressor are banks like Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, banks that really fund police brutality bonds, banks that, um, that fund the you know, pipelines that are destroying our environment, banks that, um, banks that practice redlining, banks that um, have discriminatory lending practices, um, then don't keep your money in those banks. Don't deposit, don't keep your deposits in those banks and put them into credit unions where you're a shareholder, where, you know, you have agency over your money. So your relationship with your finances is different because if you have agency over your money, so, so what I mean by that is at a credit union, when you put your money into a credit union, you're a shareholder. So you have a, you have a voting right to see where that credit union invests um, those funds. But when you put your money into a bank, it's a deposit and the, the, mm -hmm. the bank actually owns and they make all of those decisions. You have no voting rights. You have no rights. So the idea is taking agency over your money so that you have a different relationship with it. So it's not this third thing that can do evil things on your behalf and to your benefit. But it's this thing that you have a very close relationship with. And so um, whatever it's doing, it's an extension of you and your value system. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to ask a very, uh, maybe a rhetorical question, but I kind of just want to, um, I want you to explain in layman's terms, because some of us really don't know, um, explain to us what police brutality bonds are and what redlining means, if you can. Because um, here's the thing, for the past 30, 40 years, we've obviously been living in a country where um, the government has been spending trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars on policing, really policing of more brown and black communities. And they've been spending money on, um, now they have the cameras, they have all of these things that they're in mass incarceration. It's, it's taking, taking our tax dollars and we're actually giving them money and supporting mass incarceration, probably without even knowing. Right? So just, can you just explain to us and link terms what typical house, this is why this is the real, because my household is going hey, to hey, Callie, Can you tell them it's, what it's all good. This, Sorry, this is real life, it's all good. Um, but explain to us in layman terms, like what police brutality bonds are, why they're impacted, our financial future, and then what red red line it is. So police police brutality bonds are bonds that municipalities take out to pay for um, settlements and adjudicated lawsuits um, when police officers or public safety officers or agents of the municipality um, are found liable for abusing their power and hurting a civilian so what happens is um the the uh police officer hurts or abuses or enacts violence against someone and when they do that the person sues when the person sues if they get an adjudication or a settlement um the city instead of just you know and, and this is not this is not necessarily nothing but 
the city, instead of just um, paying it out out of some fund or some budget allocation, they'll do is they'll raise a bond to pay um, for this. And what happens is the banks, um, they use banks, and so the banks will raise the bond. And what happens is the taxpayers Sorry, I had to close no the worries. window. It was too much construction noise. Sorry no about that. No worries. So um, what happens is the taxpayers, um, the taxpayers actually fund the bonds. Mm -hmm. And so after the taxpayers fund the bond, the bank makes a profit on the bond um, that the city pays out. So mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's a police brutality bond. And, okay. Um, there's a few banks um, that, like Wells Fargo, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, and some hedge funds, they really make um, a profit off of those. So is this, is, are these, do we, like, when we open a bank account, this is an information, is this information, are we privy to this information when we open a bank account? Or this is something, like, we would have to already know in advance? Because I, I didn't know before following your page and listening to dialogue that you've had with other people that, um, about these police brutality bonds. So is this something that the general public is privy to, you know, when you get open yeah, it's and public, or anything? It's, it's, public it's public information. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, 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 if you go to, um, if you go to acrecampaigns.org, um, you know, there's, there, there's, a, there's a white paper on police brutality bonds. That white paper is from 2018. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so yeah, so there, there's information out there. Also, um, you know, you can you can actually request from your bank to find out where where they're investing, um, what 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 tools they're using. Um, when you have a 401k, if you have an IRA or some other investment tool or retirement tool, you can also determine where you want your money to go. So these are these are questions you can ask your bank. Um, there's something that I've been um, really trying to push to people is the is the concept of impact investing and so there are impact investment funds that you can have your 401k ira your retirement your pension 403b different tools that you can have invest in impact investment funds and the return on investment is the same it's similar to um to regular investing okay um and then with with it's basically like co-op investing and impact investing. How how does this affect, or maybe not, but how does this affect like um, the court system and like policing regimes? Like how 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 going how is it going to a um, taking our money from these larger banks to credit unions? The credit unions do not fund police brutality bonds is that what is that what it is no so so you have to find the credit so the credit union is is actually you it's, a, it's cooperative investing credit unions are typically much smaller and credit unions have um they have they have a different protocol for what they invest in or where they put money um and it's and it's based on um a community need or it's based on a community um some shared community value and so that's that's how they do it. Um, so yeah. So but but just to be clear, impact investing is not cooperative. Um, is not cooperative economics. Impact investing. Okay. Impact investing is investing in the market, and typical a typical impact investment is an investment in something that is a public private partnership, where there's a return on an investment, and that return on investment is directly tied to social good. So whether it's a community development corporation developing affordable housing, whether it's uh, a community center coming into a community um, where there's going to be some type of um, private partnership, so funds are coming in. So so it's a it's it's a it's a it's a, it's a very different thing than cooperative economics. Cooperative economics is the concept that we all have some collective value in a community, and that collective value in this community we're going to pool our money and that's how that's 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 really what a uh, credit union is okay okay um 
Talk to, us, talk to us a little bit about your stance on mass incarceration. I mean, this there's been so much uh, more awareness brought to mass incarceration. And as you know, I'm a huge advocate for, um, you know, against mass incarceration. Um, where where are things with respect to mass incarceration? Do you, are, 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 do you think the numbers will be increasing, you know, uh, or decreasing, you know, in light of the things that are going on now in our country? I don't know. I, I don't know. I think I think that um, that's a question that that Americans Americans who subscribe to this system that's a question that Americans have to ask themselves. I I don't I don't obviously I don't believe in. Um, I don't believe in police. I don't believe in prisons. I don't. I don't think that prisons necessarily rehabilitate people. I believe that. Um, I do believe that there should be some type of rehabilitation centers that practice restorative justice that return people back to society um, in a humane way. Um, so you know, and I, I don't think prison does that. But whether or not America is prepared to have a hard conversation with itself and say, hey. You know, how do we promote fairness, justice, equality in a way that is humane without without making, but at the same time, we understand that that's going to make us uncomfortable, right? And I think that that's where, that's the challenge. The challenge is we're not going to have real revolution and real changes, real, real um, changes to things that are hum inhumane until all of us get uncomfortable. We have to be unco in uncomfortable spaces with people who have been disenfranchised, who've been vulnerable, people who've been taken advantage of, and people who are on the other side of our privilege. And what I mean by that is me as, as you know, as a, as a black man, right? I have, to, I, I have to acknowledge that there are women and there are undocumented other minoritized people who are on the other side of my privilege. I benefit off of their backs. And if I'm truly about equity and truly about fairness in society, then it means that I'm willing to weaponize my privilege, right, on their behalf. And that's, that's the reckoning that America will need if it's going to be, if, you know, if this whole moment that we're seeing with people in the streets protesting, if it's going to be real. Yeah, I mean, I mean that, that, that's in general with life. Like, you have to get uncomfortable for things to actually change. So you have to have these uncomfortable com uncomfortable conversations with your white friends, your non-black friends, your black, even within our own community. Do you know what I mean? We have our own things that we have to talk about and go through with our, with our own community, so. Yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, probably the most, the, the most probably disenfranchised uh, community that I can think of is other uh, tr uh, trans women, right? Uh, uh, black trans women are 100% um, disenfranchised in a way where um, even, you know, e even, even having that conversation in certain circles now, whether it's music, whether it's TV, whether it's film, it's almost like, it's, a, it's almost like a joke. So I think that, um, I mean, it's, there's a lot. There's a lot of work to do. We all need to get uncomfortable, and get into spaces where, um, where we are honest with ourselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I love that, Keith. I love that you're comfortable as a man speaking out against um, the disenfran dis disenfranchisement of Black trans women or just trans women. Period. You're comfortable having that conversation. Um, from a, I'm speaking, from I'm, but I'm speaking specifically about black trans women. Right, right. But even just to have that conversation, I mean, mm -hmm. the average, you know, there's still there's still that gray area with just 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 men in general being comfortable having a conversation about trans, gay, bisexual, anything that's other than heterosexuality. So, um, yeah, we've been programmed to think we've been programmed to think that it makes us less. Um, less of a man mm -hmm. if, if we um, if we acknowledge other, and I think that that's the that's the, the the thing, right? Is that we all should consider ourselves other, you know, and 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 we should all be identifying with um, with the spectrum, 
there's this, you know, and I think that even it, uh, today, I was in a talk this, earlier today, and um, Daoud is a, um, is a guy that I really look up to in Brooklyn. Oh, yeah. And, as, and, and in talking to him, like, he reminded me that, you know, our, indige our indigenous roots don't even believe in this binary system yeah. of, of identity, right? And, I th and, and that there's a spectrum of identity um, and that, that is kind of like glossed over um, when it comes, you know, when it comes to sexuality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to kind of switch lanes a little bit to um, the entertainment business. You know, uh, for you, those of you guys who are just joining in, and, um, Keith is, is also an entertainment lawyer. So, you know, we've been seeing a lot of posts about um, these major music companies that have been um, taking full advantage of their artists. Um, what is that like? What is that? What, what is that shift like now? Or what does that look like moving forward for artists? I, mean, I we see a lot of artists that are taking more um, control over their their music career. They're going more independent. Um, what what's going on with that as far as uh, finances and and, and music, major music labels actually? Um, diving into the uh, this idea of, of 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 black power well i mean i think it's important for people to know that record companies are not social justice companies they're not social justice institutions so uh i mean i don't the, i mean i don't know like a company like i don't know a company that has that makes billions of dollars off of us taking a hundred million and identifying which organizations they'll, you know, they'll invest in, or I don't even know what they're what they're planning on doing mm -hmm. um, with with whatever the whatever the money is or whatever the amount is. But that's immaterial to me. You know, I think that um, if if there was an initiative to give the masters back to black artists so that they can have the generational wealth that white artists have had historically. Um, then I would be like, hey, that's progressive. That makes sense. If there was an initiative to have um, Black representation in every C-suite, um, and, I, and I don't mean Black faces, I mean Black values. And the reason why that's different is because you have people who, um, people who have Black faces, but they don't have Black values, meaning that their goal is self-preservation and their goal is to find their space, their comfortable space in white privilege, as opposed to dismantling white supremacy and making space for others. So I, you know, I, you know, a, a company, you know, promising to give a hundred million or whatever the amount is, is cute. And it's a nice gesture, but I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not moved. Yeah. I mean, I love, I love the distinction you just made um, about these companies not not just in being inclusive of a black face but having black values because and, and for those reasons that you just said because you do have people we do have some black faces in corporate america we do have black faces in the entertainment industry that are in high level positions but like you said it's about self-preservation and it's about them mixing in to what this white culture is so that that is that is huge that is that is, that's a duel right there that's a duel right there and i think that goes for not even i think but i know it not only goes for the music industry but film and television as well you know um with me being in film and television i mean there are millions of us black actors out here black writers black producers and a huge part of the problem is we only have a sprinkle of black faces in these companies or or in position to hire us, but we, we still can't even get in with them because they're so busy trying to merge in with what's going on, you know, systemically. You know, so it makes it like twenty times more challenging and more difficult. And if anything else, I'd like to see that change where black values are um, initiated with these, with, you know, with, with 
anything, music or TV, film, period. Mm -hmm. I love that point. Um, talk to us a little bit about Brooklyn Comic Con, what you guys are doing over there. I love me. I've been following you guys for a long time. You have a great mentoring program over in Brooklyn. You guys do a lot of donating, food banks. You guys have been very supportive to your community throughout this time of uh, this pandemic. Talk to us a little bit about what you guys do over there at Brooklyn Combine. Yeah, so so the Brooklyn Combine is um is a group of like professionals, right? So so we have some attorneys, some uh, some coders, developers, graphic designers. There's just a bunch of us, right? It's like eleven of us, and the idea is we're all we you know we're all centered in Brooklyn, and we all have goals around or we have ideas around how how we push this thing forward, this thing being our culture. Mm -hmm. So so on Saturdays, we, we have a mentoring program. Um, it's all ages um, where we teach coding, um, um, critical analysis of the times. Um, we do mock trials. Um, and it's, like I said, it's all ages. So we have people as young as um, eight years old. And we've had some elders come, people in their 70s come and learn coding. So we do that on Saturdays. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, we're in Red Hook um, at a school called Summit. Um, and that's part of a, a partnership with the Red Hook Community Justice Center. Um, and then on, um, and on Wednesdays, one of, one of our partners, Phil, has a small group. Um, he has a um, small, hey, Dr. Lopez. Um, Hello, Dr. Lopez. I'm sorry to cut you off. I have so much. I, I, I don't know her personally, but she is a phenomenal, phenomenal woman. So thank you for joining, Dr. Lopez. So let me just say that since she's... Please. Since, since she's, so um, all of our efforts around mentoring and education are developed in tandem with Dr. Lopez, Nadia Lopez, um, who's kind of like our anchor. Um, and she's our leader, right? I think that that's another thing. Right, is I think that um, in a lot of these spaces, everything seems to need to be male led. Um, but let me say that Nadia Lopez is our leader. Yes, um, I love it. And so, 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 yeah, so, so, so we do those things, those programs. Um, and then they're led, um, they're led with, with Dr. Lopez. Um, so, yeah, so that's the Brooklyn Combine. I mean, other than that, we, um, I want to make a distinction. So, Brooklyn Combine also partnered with Greedy Vegan. And the other institution that I'm very closely aligned with, Christian Cultural Center, which is my church, um, we've, um, we've developed a partnership where we provide meals to people who have not been able to get out during the pandemic. And mm -hmm. so, so there's, there's that. And then CCC, so Social Justice Initiative, um, we have a pantry where we provide um, groceries to 650 families a week and um, there's no sign up. There's no, you know, there's no fee. People just come to the pantry and get a bag, get two bags of groceries every Thursday. And then on Friday, we have a delivery service where we deliver groceries to families who aren't allowed um, to leave because they're under, under they're under quarantine, or families who can't leave because they're elderly or infirm. So I mean, you know, that's that's the work, and it's you know, it's not like. There's a game. I mean, I'm just one. I'm just one of a bunch of people who are part of it. The Brooklyn Combine, like mm -hmm. I said, is 11 people. But the pantry, again, that's woman led, right? Like that's an that's an initiative that I'm directing. But it's woman led. Our leader is Annette Bernard, and she's um, she's just incredible in terms of like um, getting grants for food and 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 running running it in such a way where it's incredibly efficient. Sometimes we feel like we're gonna run out of food. And she figures it out. She makes a way. So, um, so yeah. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I, I have, I think it's consistent, right? Like I, I'm in a house with six women. My wife is ab absolutely the leader, and she's, she's a boss in her own right. And then um, we have these ed initiatives with Dr. Lopez. She's absolutely, you know, absolutely a boss. Annette Bernard, absolutely a boss. Like I'm just around people who, who are really um, doing really good work. And I get to benefit from it. And again, that's like my male, that's like that male patriarchal privilege. I get to talk about it and, and get celebrated for it. But, but there, there are people that are really putting in the work.
Yeah, and I and I really want to um, commend you in public, Keith. I always send Keith emails sporadically here and there, just giving you support and everything. But I want to commend you publicly um, because you you really push the gamut of empowering women and Black women. Um, like you mentioned, Dr. Lopez. Um, I know Nicole Russell is um, someone else that you um, really support. She's an author, and she also has her own nonprofit organization. Um, your wife. Um, I, I just I see this group of women um, that you just you're very headstrong about pushing and pushing them to the forefront, and I love that. And I think we need that more in our communities where our black men stand up for black women and really. Um, instead of there being this dynamic of one in front of the other, we actually walk together. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a huge thing of what we're missing in our communities is that instead of us walking together, mm -hmm. there's this there's this whole like there's still this 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 mentality of like this male dominating you know drive you know, and I feel it, you know the mothers. We run the household, just like you like you said about your wife. You know, we 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 take care of the kids, but we also have our own Fortune 500 companies. We're we're some of the most intelligent women in these rooms, in these board of directors that are pushing forward these initiatives and these programs. We're educated, like Dr. Lopez. I mean, I I am constantly inspired by the work she does in her community and with her school. If you guys don't know Dr. Nadia Lopez, please, please follow her. I believe it's at Lopez Effect. Is that her? Um, yep. Okay. At the Lopez Effect, um, follow Nicole Russell. I believe it's at Nicole Russell. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, like I could talk about Nicole as well. Like Nicole is absolutely incredible. And she's the Precious Dreams Foundation. She's yes. founded an organization that supports um, children who are in the foster care system. And um, it's incredible work, especially because the first time that she allowed me to come and volunteer, it was at a, it was at a foster care, um, it was at ACS, and it was a space where kids are aging out. Uh, mm -hmm. It was kids who were aging out of the foster care system. And it was incredibly powerful because I saw someone who looked familiar. And what, what I realized is that she lives across, the, well, not lives, but she, sometimes she stays around the corner from my office. And so I would see her, sorry, I would see her and I never, never understood, you know, her trauma. But then when I went to, you know, this Precious Dreams comfort drop and I saw her, I got to see her. And got to yes. see her trauma. You got to think, see her. Yes. Yeah. I think that. Mm -hmm. I think that. Um. I think that. Uh. You know. These like Nicole, Dr. Lopez, Annette Bernard. Like these are people. You know, my wife is a doula. Right. These are people who are who are who are doing God's work for real. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, Keith, I thank you so so much. There was there's also a sister that I saw on your page. Um. I think it's Marbury Butts, is that her name? That you posted something. I'm not sure if I'm saying her name. Marbury Stanley Butts. Is that her name? She she was you posted her on your page and she was talking about divesting and investing. I couldn't really Oh see Marbury. It. So yeah, Marbury. So um so I, I that's not someone I know. I don't Oh know you her. don't know her. Okay. No, I don't know her. Um hi hi Taz. So another another strong and incredible woman of color is Taz, who, um, who, who does, um, who works on digital privacy. So I just want to shout her out. She's tech with Taz. Yes, tech with Taz. Yeah. Or Taz, yeah. I, I follow, because of you, I went to your page and I follow her as well. Please talk to us about Taz because she is phenomenal. She's so intelligent. So what, I, what probably should happen, because I, I don't want, I, I don't, I don't want to keep telling, telling these. Their stories. Their stories. I think yeah. we should have them on. I would love to have yeah, them. You should, you should, Thank you. I would love that. That would be awesome. Yeah. But okay, so I will connect with you later. Hopefully, to connect with these people because yeah. that is the purpose of Tuesday Tea with Mo is that so that we can broaden our communities. Thank goodness for social media and mm -hmm. for you know we have the phones that we can actually do this without actually having to meet in person. We still got our lives going on. So I want to just expand our communities. 
-hmm. Keith is in New York. I'm in LA. I have people in DC. Mm -hmm. We have people all over the country. And I think that what needs to happen is we just need to continue educating ourselves and educating each other. And this is the way that it gets done is by having these dialogues. So please, I would love to talk with Tech with Tag. I would love to talk with Nicole. I would love to talk to Dr. Russell. So that, you know, people, we can just start learning about more about each other. And thank you again, Keith, for your time. Mm -hmm. um, no I'm really, really, I, I'm not going to dig into your personal business, but it's a, it is um, a blessing to have you here because I know that you had your own bout with COVID um, mm -hmm. and you can do that. So uh, it is a huge blessing to have you here. As you know, and thank you for your prayers, my dad beat COVID and he is now home and out of the rehab center. So, um, you know, I I'm grateful to even just have you here, brother. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you to you your family for allowing us this time. Right. And uh, we'll be in touch. And um, do you want to share anything with the community? Any thoughts, any last um, suggestions or thoughts or anything? No, I mean, it, listen, I've talked, I've talked enough. I've talked a lot. Um, but I thank you. Thank you for the platform. Thank you for the opportunity to, you know, to talk with folks. And um, yeah, you know, and, I, and I'll, I'll definitely connect you with, 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 with these incredible women who, whose stories, you know, they should be telling themselves. So. Yeah. Also, your wife is a doula. I have so many pregnant women that I know. So thank you, Keith. Yeah. Have a good one and much love to you thank and your you. fam. Thank you. All right. You guys, thank you so much for joining. Keith is amazing. If you guys aren't following him, he is at Keith White. Um, I'm going, I would love to have you, Taz. I would love to speak to Nicole, Dr. Rust, um, Dr. Lod Nadia Lopez. Um, we just got to keep talking. We just have to keep talking and keep this um, line of communication open. I hope you guys have an amazing rest of your week. Um, what's up, Rob? Um, thank you for tuning in. Thank you everybody for tuning in. And um, yeah, man, we gotta we gotta keep the we gotta keep the fight going. It does not stop. It does not stop at protesting. It does not stop at you know having Black Lives Matter plastic on uh, the streets in Washington D.C. Like we have to keep going, keep going. So you guys have an amazing, amazing, beautiful week. I love you. I love myself. Let's love each other. And um, We'll see you next Tuesday on Tuesday Tea with Mo.